I really want to thank the organizers for this fantastic opportunity to share today uh, how we've been using the proteomic data in UK Biobank. So let's consider the flow of information from the genome to the phenome. Proteins really sit at the heart of it. They are the main factor for molecules on cellular function, and they capture both genetic predisposition as well as uh, lifestyle and other environmental influences. Proteins are also the largest class of pharmaceutical drug targets and FDA approved lab tests. So for all of these reasons, studying the proteome really provides unique opportunities to identify novel biomarkers. However, it is until now that we can do this at scale as the techniques that we can use to measure the circulating proteome have only recently achieved a balance between specificity and throughput. And this means that we can now measure thousands of proteins that are found circulating in blood at once. And these techniques can be broadly divided into two nowadays. So those that are based on mass spectrometry and those that are based on affinity reagents. And for the remainder of this talk, we're going to focus on one of the latter techniques, which is implemented by O-Link, which is the panel in the middle, which essentially relies on recognizing their target proteins by using two separate antibodies that are linked to complementary oligonucleotides. So the question that we wanted to address in this project was whether we could leverage these broad capture proteomic technologies to develop sparse protein signatures that would allow us to identify people who are at very high risk of developing a range of diseases in the future. And to answer this question, UK Biobank is uniquely well suited for two main reasons. The first one is that there are now plasma protein measurements available from samples that were taken at the baseline study visit in a subset of UK Biobank participants. And this was done with the Olink Explore platform, which targets around 3000 different proteins. And the second reason is that all of these participants are linked to electronic health records. And this is massively important because this enables a definition of, of, of high quality uh, diseases. And this is really uh, the work that our colleagues from UCL have been doing. Uh, so they have previously developed a phenotyping algorithm to define 308 diseases spanning a range of different clinical specialties, as you can see on the left. And what our colleagues at JSK did was to apply this phenotyping algorithm to UK Biobank to define these diseases. And for this project, we kept 218 of those for which we had more than 80 incident cases within 10 years of follow-up after the baseline study visit. So what we did was to take uh, the individuals that were randomly selected from the UK Biobank uh, uh, Pharma Proteomics project, and we excluded prevalent cases for the specific disease them into two non-overlapping sets, one for training and one for validation. Now, the first thing that we wanted to do in training was to carry out a feature selection step. And the idea here is essentially to generate a ranking that will tell us how informative each of the proteins is to be able to predict the incidence of a specific disease. And we generate this sort of thing by running lasso regression over multiple iterations. And once we have this ranking, what we can do is to identify very few, but very informative proteins to be able to make these predictions. And in this case, we restricted the selection to the top five to top 20 proteins, which we then took forward to optimize regularized Cox models and finally test how our models were performing in the held out validation set. But one of the things that's actually really important is to consider what we're going to benchmark the performance of our protein models. So for this purpose, we first developed a basic clinical model, which included common risk factors, which you can see listed on the screen. Um, however, one can think that this is actually a relatively weak benchmark, but the real beauty of UK Biobank is that there's a range of molecular information available for this participants. So on second instance, we developed a more stringent benchmark, which included information on 37 different clinical biomarkers, some of which are uh, standard blood tests that are routinely used in primary care. So we developed uh, clinical biomarker signatures exactly in the same way as we did for the proteins. So the first thing to note is that adding these protein signatures on top of the clinical risk factors significantly improved the predictive performance for 67 of the diseases under study. And this is what you can see on the screen. So the black dots here represent the concordance index for the clinical benchmark, and the colored dots represents the clinical plus protein models. So as you can see, these 67 diseases span the range of different clinical specialties, and the improvements in the concordance index were spanning from an improvement in 2% to over 30%, which is a, a quite large improvement. 
However, we also wanted to explore this with metrics that are perhaps more relevant or useful when we want to think of this in terms of screening. So what you're seeing in the first plot are the detection rates at a 10% false positive rate. On the x-axis, we can see the clinical benchmark, and on the y-axis is the clinical plus protein models. And as you can see, for all of these diseases, the detection rates were higher for the protein-based models. In the second plot on the right, you can actually see this more clearly with a different metric, which is the likelihood uh, ratio. And you can see in the orange dots, the protein-based models, and the gray dots are the clinical benchmarks. Now, for some of you who may not be familiar with this metric, let's take, for example, the top row, which is celiac disease, which ach achieved a likelihood ratio of eight. So what this basically means is that people who will develop celiac disease within the next 10 years are eight times more likely to have a high proteomic risk compared to people who won't go on to develop celiac disease. And here I want to highlight one specific example, which was the protein signature that we developed for prediction of incident prostate cancer. And this protein signature included a very well-known biomarker, which is PSA, or prostate-specific antigen, which is a biomarker that has actually been tested in screening trials and in clinical practice. So one thing that was really striking to see is that for a, a wide range of diseases, the likelihood ratios that were achieved by these protein signatures were comparable to that of prostate cancer or even higher. So really encouraging uh, results in, on this aspect. Um, but one of the things that we always have to think about is where uh, this sort of uh, a test would be more useful. So again, using celiac disease as an example, the first column which I'm trying to represent is the scenario where we think that we would want to apply this sort of protein test to the general population, where we know that the incidence of celiac disease is relatively low. However, a more relevant scenario is the column on the right, where we would think that we actually want to screen a population that we already know is, is at increased risk of developing celiac disease. So in this case, for example, we could take people with other autoimmune conditions, where we know that it is estimated that around one in 18 of these individuals will then go on to be uh, diagnosed with celiac disease. And as you can see in the second row, you can immediately see the benefit of applying such a screening test in this high risk population. And ultimately, what this translates into is that once that we apply this test to an individual and we get a high proteomic risk, this essentially means that this person will have a much higher probability of indeed going going on to develop uh, celiac disease. But then again, uh, we wanted to really do some stringent comparisons with blood tests that are currently available and routinely being used. So in this plot, uh, the first one again is the detection rates on the x-axis for the biomarker-based models and on the y-axis for the protein-based models. And on the second plot, you can similarly see the likelihood ratios and you can see this a little bit more clearly. So the orange dots are the protein-based models and the blue dots are the biomarker-based models. Now, if we first focus on the bottom of the plot, we can see a range of diseases for which the biomarkers actually performed better than the proteins. And these are neat positive examples where the biomarker signature included diagnostic tests. So these are examples such as a uric acid for gout, or fasting glucose and HbA1c for diabetes, and so on. But as you can actually see, for the majority of these diseases, and these are 52 of those, the protein models outperformed uh, these clinical biomarkers. And um, finally, one of the points that I want to make, and one thing that is really neat about UK Biobank, is that we can do this systematically across many different diseases. And this really allows us to address the question of whether the proteins that we are picking up are specifically predictive for one disease, or whether they are predictive across more than one of these diseases. And we identified 147 of these predictive proteins, which were predictive across more than one disease. And as you can see on the plot, actually the majority of these were predictive across more than one clinical specialty. And if we go to the other end of the spectrum, we can actually identify those proteins that are specifically predictive for single diseases. And in this plot, you can see a range of examples, but I'm only going to highlight one of these, which is TNF-RSF-17, which was specifically predictive for the incidence of multiple myeloma. Now, some of you may actually know this protein better as BCMA, which is a really interesting example as this is the target of several approved therapies for the treatment of refractory multiple myeloma. So in this study, uh, we found that BCMA is actually strongly and specifically predictive of myeloma even 10 years before overt onset of, of this disease. 
So just to briefly summarize, I hope I've convinced you of the tremendous potential of these sparse protein signatures to identify people who are at high risk of developing diseases in the future, and to really highlight uh, that doing this systematically across many different diseases can help us identify those biomarkers that are specific and those that may actually represent more general markers of multimorbidity. And of course, this is a nice start for us, but there's some future work to do. Um, so of course, we've been able to compare against some biomarkers that are available in UK Biobank, for, but for some diseases, there's very specific blood tests against which we'll have to benchmark our, our protein signatures in the future. And of course, the second point is that we have to externally validate some of these findings. Um, and there's two different aspects to this. So the first one is to also use alternative proteomic technologies and to test how these signatures generalize to populations that are ethnically diverse. And on this second point, we are really excited to be working on a proteomic pilot in the East London Genes and Health Study, which is a study of uh, British, Bangladeshi and Pakistani individuals. So we're really looking forward to explore some of these findings there. And finally, I really want to take a moment to acknowledge everyone who has been involved in this fantastic project. This has been a tremendous industry academia collaboration, and I can only say that I've been lucky to have been a part of this. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.